We're going to dive into the final of the seven I am statements of Jesus. Open your Bibles to John chapter 15, and I'm going to read today from John chapter 15. That'll be on the screen, as well as from Isaiah chapter 5. So follow along as I read. Jesus said, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me, everybody say in me, that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Verse three, already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do 10% of the work. <laughs> Apart from me, you can do. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. Now, uh, Isaiah chapter five, uh, beginning in verse one. Let me sing for my beloved my song concerning his vineyard. Do, do you hear the theme? My beloved has a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it, hewed out a wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded what? Wild grapes. Wild grape. Now, that, that's not, he wasn't, he wasn't looking for Presbyterian grapes and he got Pentecostal <laughs> grapes, you know. Uh, that's not the idea. The, the idea is he was looking for grapes that could produce good wine, but instead he got something else. Now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard? Now, Isaiah's prophesying when the nation of Israel is in exile, and so he, there, there's a picture here that's being painted of a vineyard that is the nation of Israel, and because of their rebellion towards God, Instead of becoming a fruitful nation, instead, um, they, they turned very different. When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled. I will make it a waste, and it will not be pruned. And that's exactly what happened to the nation of Israel that rebelled against God. Let's pray. Father, today, uh, we want to hear the words of Jesus we want to hear the words of Jesus to our hearts, to the very center and the core of who we are. Father, today we don't come to a dispenser of good advice. We don't come to a book filled simply with wise words. We come to the fountain of living water, life itself. And so open our ears to hear. Open our eyes to see what you would say and speak to every one of us and make come alive by the work of your spirit. Lord, we, we open ourselves to you. Have your way. Heal us, forgive us, renew us. Lord, light us on fire for the things of God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. There were seven I am statements of Jesus that we've looked at over the last seven weeks. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life, I'm the light of the world. I'm the gate for the sheep. I'm the good. By the way, if you didn't listen to the message, the gate for the sheep, that was one of the best, and that, that, was, that was fun. It was phenomenal. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I was so sad I didn't get to be here to preach that. That's one of my favorites. But Pastor Bob was here and did an incredible job. I am the way and the truth and the life. Thank you, Pastor Janice, for bringing in a great message, the way and the truth and the life. And finally, Jesus said, I am the true vine. And all of these I am statements are meant by Jesus to be taken as, as, a, as a kind of a montage, if you will, a kaleidoscope, if you will, like a stained glass with broken pieces that make one whole picture because the I am statement makes everybody that knows their, their history of the story of God with his people look back to the moment when Moses encountered God at the burning bush and Moses was called to this point of, of impossible deliverance uh, to go and make God's intention to free his people from captivity in Egypt known to Pharaoh. And when Moses said to God, on whose authority will this deliverance take place? God said to Moses, tell them, I am 
I am sent you. And so now Jesus, making these I am statements on his way to the cross as he pronounces the kingdom of God is at hand, he's very clearly making not only the statement, yes, he is the bread of life and the light of the world and all of these attributes about his nature and character come alive by the way that he tells the story. But he's also making a bigger statement. He's saying this, I have come to deliver people from bondage and slavery. And, and, and as great as a deliverer as Moses was, I am the greater and the better and the truer deliverer where Moses delivered people from captivity to a tyrannical leader who held people in physical slavery. I have come to set people free from their emotional, spiritual bondage that will plague them through eternity. I am better, I am strong, and I come on my own authority because I am God. And that, so that's the picture that's being painted. And what's interesting is you can look at the seven statements of Jesus and, and leading up to this point, he's called people to respond to him, to believe in him. And now in this final I am statement, he's really speaking to people who are already following him. And the call here is not so much to believe for the first time or to trust for the first time, but here, I am the vine and you are the branches is a statement to those who are following him to say in, in what you will face in the future, stay close, abide in me. For once you are connected to me, you, your life is meant to be a fruitful life and there's a way in which God is going to produce that fruit in your life. And let me say this to you, if you're a follower of Jesus, it doesn't matter if that's happened five minutes ago or if it's been 50 years ago. It doesn't matter how many mistakes you've made along the way, but if you've held on to faith and if you've believed in Jesus, then let me say this, God's intention for you is to have a fruitful life. It may not be the fruitful life that the American gospel has promised, but it's the fruitful life that brings glimpses and shadows of heaven and makes the work of the Spirit of God real in your life, makes the peace that surpasses understanding real in your life, makes the joy of the Lord real in your life, makes the power, the resurrection power of Jesus real in your life. That's part of the fruit of the life that abides in Christ. So, what's the point? Jesus, in this six verses that we read, speaks to three shifts that need to take place in the lives of the people hearing and certainly in the lives of those hearing today. And the three shifts are this, from a national identity to a personal faith, from false growth to authentic fruitfulness, and then from independence to complete dependence. That's our outline for this morning. Gave it to you in advance so that as we move forward, you have hope that we're coming to a conclusion at some point. <laughs> First, from a national identity to a personal faith. Uh, look at verse one. Jesus said, I am the, here's the key word, I am the true vine. I may have added that later. I am the true vine. Did you catch that when we read it earlier? I am the true vine. You didn't just say I'm the vine, I'm the true vine. Why does that matter? Because if, if, you, if you could put yourself in the shoes of the hearers, particularly the religious leaders of the day, Jesus is walking around on his journey to the cross and as he gets closer and closer to Jerusalem and closer and closer to his encounter with Golgotha, he, he starts saying these things that are incendiary to the religious leaders of the day. And, and the big picture that Jesus is pointing to is that your, your reliance on your connection to God because of the temple, because of your Jewish heritage, is not sufficient any longer. I have come as the way and the truth and the life, and you can know that, there, that something greater than the temple has come. Th those are Jesus' words. And it was incendiary to the religious leaders because their whole identity and hope and faith was rooted in what was, and they were ignoring the prophetic words that God had given time and time again from the prophets saying, but there's a savior coming, there's a Messiah coming, there's a way in which these promises are going to be filled that's greater, and Jesus said the greater has come. 
He said, the greater has come. And so when he says, I'm the true vine, what, what is he picking at? Well, he's picking at this imagery that has been consistent throughout um, the, the national heritage of Israel in the way in which they were that vine and vineyard that God was planting and making to be fruitful. We read about it in Isaiah, but you can read about it in various places in Scripture, in the Psalms, in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, time and time again, because a vineyard was so commonplace in their culture that that picture was used over. And in fact, I have a picture, an artist rendition that um, when you would, uh, Josephus, who's a first century uh, historian, writes that when you would uh, approach the entrance to the temple, the pillars on either side of the entrance to the temple were wrapped in these uh, vines with grapes that were as big as a man. And it was all pointing back to that you are the vineyard. It, and if you think about it, when the spies, when the 12 spies went into the promised land, um, remember what they brought back? They brought back a cluster of grapes that was so big that two men had to carry it on a pole between the two of them. So there was this connection between fruitfulness and God's fulfillment and the, the national identity that was all being, that was used um, to exemplify in this idea of the vineyard. So when Jesus comes and says, I am the true vine, it's as inflammatory as him saying something greater than the temple has come. Because what he's saying is this, everything you've looked to for your identity and for the fulfillment of God's promises is now being supplanted by my life and my death and my resurrection. And so he's saying, whatever you've looked to to find yourself and your identity in the past, now look to me because I am the true and everything that's come before me is a shadow. And I wonder if there's any ways in which in the world that we're living in today, there's a way in which people have conflated their spirituality and national identity. Don't you love those signs? God, guns, and then fill in the blank. Can we talk for a second? I don't know if you guys know, but November's coming. And I'm not talking about Thanksgiving, and I'm not talking about football. And this message is not a message about politics, and it's not a message about the forthcoming election. We'll talk about that in the, in the between now and then. But what it is about is I want you to look at this and recognize that Jesus made it very clear that the transformation in the lives of people that he came to bring was not going to be the overflow of political revival. And, and what every Christian has to decide is the changes that you wanna see in government the overflow of political revival, or will the changes in government be the overflow of spiritual revival? And I wanna suggest to you that, that everything that happens when it comes to the laws of the land matter. And God's, God's exhortation to the people when they were living in exile, and by the way, you are living in exile. This is not heaven. It, and, and until you get to heaven, you're living in exile. This is not your home, right? So you're living in exile. And when the nation of Israel was living in exile, God's, God's exhortation to them in Jeremiah 29 was to seek the peace and prosperity in the land in which you've been exiled. And so, yes, there's a way in which you need to be involved and you need to understand and, and we need to pray for, for people, God-fearing people that are involved in the political realm. But hear me. The, the transformed lives in the renewed community are not downstream from changes in the political spectrum. The changes in political spectrum are downstream from the revival that will happen in the hearts of people. Do you see that? Do you see that? So it matters, but we have to understand which comes first and what needs... Before, listen, yes, we can pray for two things at the same time, but may God revive his church 
and a revived church will have greater impact and influence than any legislation that could be passed. That is not to say that the legislation is insignificant or unimportant. I'm not saying that what I am saying is that something greater than the temple has come and his name is Jesus. Can we move on from that? From a national identity to a personal faith. Number two, from false growth to authentic fruitfulness. Verse number two, Jesus said, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Everybody say prunes. That it may bear more fruit. First of all, what is the fruitfulness that Jesus is talking about? Now be very careful here because if you're not careful, fruitfulness can come across as being whatever you want or desire. Therefore, if you have a fruitful life, you have a life that gets what you want. Huh? And you can, listen, you just go dial in for dollars on, the, on YouTube and you will find preachers and teachers that will tell you that God's highest and best for you is to be happy, to be wealthy, and, and to have influence. And by the way, I have an affection for all of those things <laughs> at some level. But when I look at the life of Jesus, he was distinctly lacking in all of those things. Anybody with me? And the point isn't so much to say that you will be known by how much money is in your bank account or how many Instagram followers you have or you don't have, that only the faithful will suffer and, or, or on the opposite end of the spectrum, that the faithful will have more than enough. The point is simply this, that Jesus is getting to the heart of, of a transformation, a change, a fruitfulness that, that emanates from the inside out, from a connected relationship with Jesus out. And whatever the context is in poverty or in great provision, that there is a fruit of righteousness, a fruit of the divine life, connectedness with Jesus that will emanate from those who are abiding in him. And we read about fruit, Galatians chapter five, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Listen, when we talk about discipleship and the process of sanctification, we can, we can talk about all the classes you could take and all the books you could read and all the knowledge you could garner, but I also want us to come back and say, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How are we doing? Like, how are we doing? Not in believing that those things are the fruit of the Spirit. That's not, not how are we doing in that. But how are we doing that those things are the fruit of our lives? And I'm not talking about supermarket shopping fruit. Like where you go to the supermarket, and we're good at this as Christians, right? If you're a Christian and you've been around and you know what fruit is supposed to look like, it's really easy on your way to church, when you're angry at your kids and you're angry at your dog and you're angry at your spouse and you're angry at your boss, on the way you pick up some, some, some spiritual fruit at the grocery store, you kind of tuck it into your armpits and put it in your pockets and you walk into church and like drop an apple, <laughs> drop an orange, just to make sure that everybody knows that you're bearing the fruit of the Spirit. But that's not the... I think I... Struck a nerve. <laughs> and, on, and on some way, I'm, I'm, I'm not just making fun of anybody or claiming to be innocent of doing the very thing. But what I'm saying is that that is not only a religious life, it's exhausting. Because while you're faking it on the outside, on the inside, at some level, you're asking the question, there has to be more than this. And Jesus is saying, there is more than this for those that abide in me. The fruit of the Spirit is, is righteousness, Philippians chapter 1, verse 11. But the, the fruit of the Spirit is a life of Christ that's emanating from you. But Jesus says, 
very clearly that those that are fruitful are going to be pruned. And if you understand what that means, when you read that, you should say, ouch. And to understand, I want you to paint a picture, and then I'm gonna introduce you to somebody that some of you already know that's gonna talk a little bit about this. But I want you to picture Jesus making his way from the upper room down the Valley of Kidron towards ultimately where he is going to be betrayed. And as he makes his way down that hill, at this time of the year, there would have been fires burning on the hillside that were being fueled by the branches from the vineyards that they had collected and were burning in preparation for the next season. And as they walk down, probably on a moonlit night with fires all around, Jesus says, this has to take place for your life to be fruitful. And there are some things about pruning that those that Jesus was walking with would have understood intuitively because they lived in a culture that was surrounded by grapes and vineyards. One of the things that they would have understood is that there's a difference between a leafy vineyard and a fruitful vineyard. And in fact, a fruitful vineyard and a leafy vineyard are counterproductive to one another. And that's why the vine dresser has to prune. A friend of mine, Jonathan Halstead, who's the director of HealthBridge Global, whom you've partnered with in building um, out a hospital in Egypt, and we're gonna have some great um, stories to tell about that in the very near future. But he actually lived on property and ran a vineyard uh, for several years, and during that time, he would tell me all kinds of stories about what he was learning that made this chapter of the Bible come alive. And so I asked him to share some of that, specifically some of the things that he had to do taking care of his vineyard that would seem counter, counterintuitive um, to, to somebody like me. So watch this. Jonathan Halstead. Hey, hey. Good to see you. Thanks for taking some time to be with us today. Yeah, man, my pleasure. So you have some firsthand experience with the subject matter that we're learning about today. And you shared some things with me over the years that have really helped me understand the picture that Jesus is painting, uh, particularly in the area of some of the things that would seem less desirable about what Jesus is talking about. So will you share some of your insights? and um, help us get a grasp on this from somebody that's, that's actually done it. Yeah, I'd be happy to share all, all my mistakes openly. Um, now we, we did, we had the privilege of living on a vineyard and um, growing grapes and even making a little bit of wine for about five, six years. And I would say one of the most profound things that we learned was that you basically have um, a choice between like super lush green growth or getting ripe usable fruit. But it's pretty hard and pretty rare to actually do both. They're, they're mostly incompatible. And so there, there's a couple of tools that we would use and that most wine growers or grape growers use to try to get fruit versus just growth. And, and the first is um, what we call thinning. And there's really kind of three ways you can thin or th three things we do to thin out the vines. And the first is you actually hedge them. And everyone's probably seen pictures of grapevines that look like they just got a, a flat top cut, right? That's hedging. You're just getting rid of like all that growth that just wants to go up and, um, and over and it'll even bend over and touch the ground which brings even more problems because now you're introducing like pest and more mildew and stuff. So you want to keep them clean. You want to keep them low. You want to keep them cut back. Actually, you don't just want vines that grow everywhere. Um, the second tactic is, is what we would call like the removal of suckers. So there's all these like additional shoots that will try to grow out of the vines and they're providing absolutely nothing except they make it look really lush because it's more green and it's more leaves, but they're actually sucking nutrients away from the vines that are trying to actually grow the fruit. So 
throughout the entire growing season, you're like removing those. You're constantly going through the vineyard, getting rid of those suckers. And then you're also removing leaves, especially as you get closer to harvest. Um, you're removing leaves to, to open it up, to again, remove kind of excess foliage that's unnecessary. And all of that is really, really with the goal of, of opening up the vines for air and sunlight. Air and sunlight um, helps control the mildew, helps the, the grapes ripen, helps them mature, and helps ensure that the most nutrients go right to the fruit instead of all this other stuff. And then the other uh, tactics that the tactic that is used is just the limitation of water. Um, most vines will look amazing if they get all the water they want, but they actually kind of go into like non-production mode if they get all the water they want. So most grape growers will try to find that balance of like um, almost starving the grapes of water, making them just thirsty enough honestly, that they go into reproduction mode, um, and they, which means grapes, right? They're producing grapes. That's the reproduction. And so you, you, you actually limit the water, um, and that, that produces generally riper fruit, uh, better tasting fruit, the fruit with that right like acid sugar balance. Um, and so I would say most rookie um, grape growers give their, their vines way too much water because they look like they're struggling. But the whole point is they should struggle if they're going to produce good fruit. There's so much there that helps us understand what Jesus is communicating. And, you know, for me, you and the description of that have helped me understand some of the ways that through what feel like times of real struggle or lack, Jesus is actually doing something in you so that you can produce more and better fruit. And so thanks for shedding light on that for us. And um, as a side note, thanks for all that you and HealthBridge have done and the partnership that we've been able to have um, that's been really exciting over the years. So thanks, Bro, John. The pleasure's all ours. You guys are amazing. Your church is amazing. Your people are amazing. So yeah, it's an honor to, to do anything with you guys. I hope to see you soon. See you soon. Thanks, buddy. First of all, I just have to make the obvious observation. John Halstead is one of the most handsome guys you'll ever meet. <laughs> and his wardrobe, and uh, it's impeccable. Here's the second thing that I want you to take away from that is this, that pruning is not punishment. It is God preparing you for greater fruitfulness. that oftentimes the process of God taking away what you think you want and need to have fullness is actually God setting you up to be fruitful. And it's so easy. It's so easy to think that the Christian life should be everything's good, I'm happy, I got money coming out of my pockets, everybody loves me. When the reality is you, you walk with Jesus and everybody that's walked with Jesus knows that there are these seasons where it feels like, I just got an arm cut off. <laughs> and not only that, I feel like I'm in a desert dying of thirst. And the temptation is to say, what have I done wrong? And, and of course, there are consequences to decisions that we make. But, but even then, loved ones, God is the one who is able to redeem even your greatest failures and your greatest mistakes. And it is through times of, oftentimes, of not getting what you want and what you think you need that there is, there is a deeper well that is being dug in your life. And this is so often why we have to be proactive in engaging discipleship. This is oftentimes the process of sanctification. Friends, listen, to be justified means that when you become a Christian and you are born again, that you are forgiven and you are as loved by God as you ever will be. 
Sanctification is the process from that day forward of your life being more and more conformed into the image of the one who saved you. And inevitably, that means that you bring desires with you when you become a Christian that are not born of the Spirit of God and need to be pruned away. And let me, and listen, and listen, if you're under 25, you have been inundated with a message that says in order to live the good life, you need to figure out who you are on the inside and everything that you think you want and need needs to be activated so that you can be fully alive. And that is a message of absolute bull malarkey. <laughs> any more, any more than saying, Give a three-year-old whatever they want. Let them go wherever they want to go, and they're going to be okay. Nobody would do that. And God loves you enough that the process of becoming a fruitful, fulfilled follower of Jesus is often a process of pruning. And that comes down to our, our desires for security and wealth. It can come down to our desires for approval of people. It can come down to our sexual desires what we view about our own sexuality simply based on how we feel and what we want. And I'm talking about those heterosexual impulses and homosexual impulses, all of which are desires that are deeply ingrained into human beings. The point is simply this. The gospel says over and over again, your desires don't always point you to everlasting life. And I'm not picking on anybody. I'm picking on everybody. <laughs> Did I just say that I wasn't and I was? Yeah. Jesus is picking on everybody because it applies to all of us. And the point is this. Your desires can't define you if you want a life of fruitfulness and abundance. And that's why when you look at Jesus' words, what does he say? He says, it's his word that makes you clean. How is it that we know the way and the truth and the life and who we were created to be? What to do with those des desires to be popular, those desires for wealth? What do we do? We look to Jesus. And when my desires and his life don't line up, then I say, Jesus, transform me, change me, sanctify me, prune me. Lastly, Jesus calls us to make the shift from independence to complete dependence. I wanna come back to the question that I asked you at the beginning as we come to a conclusion and ask you to answer this question. In order to be happy, what do you need? In order to be happy, content, peaceful, what do you need? Now you're in church and so you know that the right answer is Jesus. <laughs> but if you would take a step back from that and say what is it really that your heart's been aching for? What is it that's caused anxiety because you have a lack of? What have you compromised your convictions to go after because you need it so bad? Because that'll point you to what you really believe and what you really think you need. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, obviously, you can do a lot of things without Jesus. I can make waffles without Jesus. We can do a lot of things without Jesus. So he's not saying you can't move, breathe, but here's what he's saying. You won't find anything of real life, anything that your heart actually desires, you, you won't find the peace that you long for to put your head on the pillow at night and sleep. You won't find healing. You won't find purpose. You won't find forgiveness. You won't find 
freedom from the shame that you carry. Accept through him. Every other attempt is chasing after something that will overpromise and under deliver on what you really need in life. And so to abide in him is to say less of me and more of you. To abide in him is to fill your life more and more with his word. To abide in him is to embrace the pruning. To abide in him is to integrate into intergenerational, faithful Christian community. To abide in him is to love even your enemies. To abide in him is to forgive. To abide in him is to lose your life so that you can find life. Because apart from him, you can do nothing. And what I think uh, is profound, Jesus says, if you don't buy a bare fruit, then you're gonna be, you're gonna be taken away and, and thrown into the fire. And by the way, that should not strike fear in the heart of any person that is wondering, man, I'm really trying to fi find Jesus. I'm really trying to pursue Jesus, but I've made mistakes. Am I about to be thrown in the fire? No, you're not because the very impulse and desire and concern that you have is the indication that the Holy Spirit is at work in your life. The best example of somebody that, that would be cut off and thrown into the fire was Judas, who had made a decision to be opposite, to be anti the work and the way of Christ. And you'll know when you've come to that point. And anything short of that, then what you're experiencing is not the cutting off to destruction, it is the pruning to your fruitfulness. Because here's what we see about the gospel, is that there was a vine that deserved to be burned in the fires. And not only did Jesus become the vine to everlasting life, Jesus also became the vine that was thrown into the fire. He became the vine that was wild and when he was crucified, he bore the punishment and the shame that was intended ultimately for those who rebelled against God. And Jesus said, I will be that vine. And he was burnt, he was extinguished. And then God raised him to life so that now and forevermore he could say, I am the true and the better vine and the everlasting life that I now offer to you is fueled by the same power that raised me from the grave. And that's the invitation to you and to me today is to abide in him and to draw on that resurrection power My challenge to you today is that if you've, if you've never said yes to Jesus, then man, you, you start there by faith. But for those of you who have, to examine your abidingness as we look into a new season and move into the autumn time, it's the prime time of the year for you to look and stop and pause and see and say, God, how is Christ being formed in me? How am I abiding in him? What am I really looking for, for security and acceptance and significance? And allow God to do a pruning process, not just so that you can experience suffering. No, that's not the point of it. The point of it is because you were meant by God to be fruitful. And that is what we do as a church. This is why we do spiritual formation. It's, it's why we gather together. It's why we gather in other venues the way that we do. Why? For one reason, so that we can learn to abide in Christ. And that when we walk through the pruning seasons of our life, you don't have to do it alone. That you have that voice of encouragement so that you too can be a fruitful follower of Jesus. So that we together can be a vineyard that, that 
that exemplifies the heart of God, that demonstrates what fruit, true fruitfulness is, that the world could see that you can go after wild grapes, but it is all fluff and no substance, but there is life and life abundant for those who would come through faith in Jesus Christ, the true vine.